train tracking using DAS. And I look forward to that. A little bit of history. Uh, there's been five WDFs. At WDF 13, and the, the format of WDF is actually quite simple. It covers what we have now, it covers what we're developing for the near future, the stuff we know we're going to do, and, and there's always the element of looking into the future, innovation. In 2013, the WDF at that time was opened with a presentation on DAS, and it was opened in the futuristic technology section. Uh, and if people were there, they remember that presentation, and at the end of it, there was about a third of you thought that was interesting, uh, a third of you was, it's interesting, but it'll never happen. And the other third just thought the speaker was crazy. Uh, and look where we've gone from that presentation in 2013. DAS has now become a part of the DNA of many railways. And in the future, you're going to see this in a much larger set of deployments and technical, uh, technological advances. So for me, to introduce three guys is not just a pleasure, it's an honour. And I'd like to introduce the first presenter, Gareth Lees, and he's the Research Director of AP Sensing. And he comes from 25 years experience in photonics. So please welcome Gareth Lees, AP Sensing. <laughs> because uh, I can talk for a long time about this subject. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give um, a bit of an overview on, on DAS. Um, DAS for air monitoring. But first of all, I've got a few slides just about AP Sensing, because um, a lot of people have come up to me and said, um, oh, you work at AP Sensing, what, what do you guys do? Um, so AP Sensing are a global organisation. Um, the headquarters is in Germany, in Stuttgart, just outside Stuttgart. Um, that's where we have our production facility um, and the majority of our employees. Um, I'm based in the UK, uh, in Basingstoke, which is just outside of London. Um, and in Basingstoke we have a great team of data scientists and, and software engineers who, who are focused on, on DAS and DAS data. Because um, those of you who've used DAS, uh, you know that it's, uh, it's all about what you do with the data. Um, the data is very important in DAS. Um, the other Areas around the world are uh, project engineering and sales staff, so that we can support our clients anywhere in the world. So, a bit more about the history of the company. Um, although AP Sensing um, is less than 100 employees at the moment, um, it comes from a much bigger background, it comes from a much bigger her heritage. Um, the, the site, which we're based on in Germany, um, used to be HP, um, and HP then um, diversified into um, AP Sensing, sorry, into Ashton Technologies, um, and then from Ashton Technologies we became AP Sensing, and we span off um, a DTS business from Ashton Technologies into AP Sensing. Uh, so the background is much bigger than the, the company. What we span out of Ashton Technologies was a DTS, and a lot of our core markets are DTS based. Uh, DTS uh, is a temperature sensor, a distributed temperature sensor. Um, our main markets are power cable monitoring um, and um, fire detection. So we have DTSs installed in a, a, a lot of tunnels, uh, the majority of tunnels. Um, and uh, we put DTSs on subsea power cables um, uh, and uh, they, they use them to monitor the power going through the cables so that you can optimise the power going through those power cables. Also, pipeline monitoring and LNG and lots of other um, application areas. So initially, we were, we were a DTS business. And in the past few years, we've diversified again into DAS, uh, which uh, uses very similar optical components uh, to give us acoustic information back from the finder. So DAS, so DAS essentially um, is a box. Um, it's uh, um, an optical unit, which is the, the, the unit on the top, and then uh, the bigger unit is, is the processing unit. And a lot of the innovative work which has been done and that you've seen, um, certainly um, in the next couple of slides anyway, um, and over the past couple of days, 
all that technology is kind of being done in the processing box. It's all about the software and what you do with the data. Obviously, when you have the interrogator, you also need uh, the optical cable to go with it. Um, and uh, in your kind of applications, that runs alongside the, uh, the, the, the train tracks. Um, in a lot of our other application areas, it's usually buried um, a metre, two metres below the ground uh, in a duct. Um, and with that kind of configuration, we can pick up people walking 10, 20 metres away. So the system is very sensitive, um, and that's something that is often underestimated um, when people talk about DAS. Uh, it's an incredibly sensitive system for acoustics. When you have the interrogators and you have the cable, um, you have all of these functions enabled. Um, you can pick up people digging, you can pick up uh, uh, obviously train traffic, um, you can pick up when uh, on the subsea cables, if there's an anchor going across the cable, you can pick up all of these kind of events. So the application space for DAS is absolutely huge. And that's why there's so much interest in the technology at the moment. So, onto the technology. Um, this is kind of a, a, a bit technical. Um, so, that has evolved over the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, the actual first reported um, kind of DAS signal was many years before that. Um, this is a typical test, the results from a typical test, where you create an impulsive event on the ground. Um, and there's many ways of doing that. In this case, it was just basically a rock uh, dropping from a height. Um, the seismic guys use um, um, configured tools to do the same thing. But it gives you a good idea of the response of the DAS to an applied signal. Uh, again, in this case, the cable is buried below the ground. So we're dropping a rock and we're looking at the signal which is buried. Now, this particular signal is from a, a technology in the industry we call an amplitude-based technology. Um, it uses the amplitude of the signal um, to give you the information that you see on the screen. The problem with that is that it, it's a random signal, and it's random in its, its amplitude, um, and it's random in its sensitivity. So the signal you get back, this signal here, although there's a drop and the, 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 the sound wave is moving out, the acoustic wave is moving away from that drop, it's not a particularly nice, clean waveform. Um, which is what we're aiming for. So this is nice, it can identify things going on, it can tell you that something's happening, but it's not good enough to tell you what's actually happening. And it's certainly not good enough to use techniques such as machine learning um, and some more advanced um, signal processing techniques. So th th this is, again, what we call an amplitude-based DAS. So this is a, the same, exactly the same weight drop uh, we measured using two pieces of equipment. Um, so it's exactly the same event, but using a phase-based DAS. And, and as you can see, the waveform is very clearly defined. Um, you, can see, you can measure um, that first arrival of the waveform onto the cable. Um, and this is the kind of data which you can actually do a lot with. You, you can, you, you, every time I drop that weight, I get the same signal. Um, whereas in the previous um, example, the signal would be subtly different. It'd be, it's a speckle-based pattern. Whereas here, I can keep dropping that rock and I can keep on getting that signal. Um, turning that to you, the kind of rail applications, every time a train comes past, you can get the same signal using phase-based systems. So the technology of DAS is advancing and the advancing hardware enables a lot of these applications. Um, so my next couple of slides are about um, the kind of state of the art in terms of DAS um, and where we've been pushing the limits to, uh, relating to, to the rail applications. So one of the issues um, with, with rail is that you've got huge networks. Um, you've got huge, long, we would call them linear assets. Um, so pushing the range of DAS obviously brings the cost per meter down. Um, you could do a lot of things to increase the range on a DAS in terms of inter internally to the optics. You can increase laser powers, you can um, change the way you interrogate the, the light coming back. Um, but what I'm showing here is by um, a good use of, of fibre selection, um, in this case it was an OFS, ultra low loss fibre, you can really push those ranges into kind of 100 kilometer plus. Um, the signal at the end here, uh, you can just about see um, this 
kind of periodic signal at the end. This was set to be a rough uh, magnitude of a, a train, and at 117 kilometers, it's quite clear. So for, for some of the train tracking applications, uh, certainly the technology is there to do over 100 kilometers. So one of the uh, things we're really proud of is uh, um, the, the kind of toolkit we've put together um, to enable a lot of these applications. Um, our software is something we're, we're quite rightly very proud of. Uh, a lot of our clients come and say that it's very easy to use, um, it's very intuitive, um, and it gives you the right kind of information. And we've always worked from a client-led perspective on our software. Um, so this is our configuration tool. Um, you can set up a lot of rules here, um, so when things are happening uh, on your fiber, you can say, I'm only interested if he's got a velocity between uh, 20 and 40 kilometers an hour. Um, and you can set that rule up and you can apply it to a zone and you will only see things which have a certain velocity. So the, the system comes with the ability to set these rules. Um, widths as well, I'm only interested in events of a width greater than 50 meters. Um, you can set that rule up as well um, and apply these rules to, to your system. Um, on top of that, um, something which um, I know is going to be discussed in the, the next presentations, um, we can set different machine learning modules. Um, so if we've trained the system to uh, pick up certain events, we can select a model and we can say, on this section of track, um, please use this machine learning model to reinforce the signals you're seeing. Uh, this reduces false alarms and gives us a bit more confidence in the, the signals we're seeing. And you can apply different models depending on uh, which parts of the track you're, you're looking at. Um, and this section here, uh, which is the one when you're configuring your system, you spend a lot of time on, um, it's configuring the fibre and matching that to the assets um, on the ground. The other software we're quite proud of is our Smart Vision software. It enables us to take data from the system and display it. In this particular case, I'm just taking the energy data and I'm putting it on top of a map. And it's just basically two trains which are traveling along that particular track. Um, we're not doing anything clever with the data, it's purely just ex the energy coming back from the, the DAS unit. Um, we can do a lot more with that data, uh, and I'll show you um, on the next slide um, how we can use the data we're acquiring to do clever stuff. So this is a, this is a more technical plot, it's, a, it's an energy plot, so it tells us how much energy the DAS is picking up. Um, let me run this video. Um, the kind of pink circles there um, are um, when the system's decided that it's a train. So there's a lot going on on this plot. Um, here you can see there's a, some small um, dots appearing down here. Every small dot is a system saying, yeah, my machine learning is telling me it's a train, that's fantastic, it's a train. When it's got certain confidence levels, um, it turns into a, a, a larger alarm. We call them alarms, but it's really an event. The smaller ones, which aren't associated with trains, they come and they go, and the system sees things, but if it's not a train, it doesn't worry about it, and uh, it, just, it just disappears. Um, I picked this particular part of track, it's 10 kilometers of track, because there's three stations in it, um, so it's quite a, quite a challenging section of track. Um, trains are stopping and starting, and, it's not running real time, by the way, it's running at eight times speed. Um, so it, it, and here, uh, which has just gone by, there's a tunnel, so the, the signal just gets a bit wider as it kind of you know, echoes in that tunnel. So there's features you can see on the, um, on the track. Moving on from that, what each one of those bubbles tells you in terms of our system um, it gives you the, the velocity of the train, it gives you the position, and it gives you the length. So each one of those dots you saw in that previous video, it has information associated with it. And that information can be grabbed from the system um, using various software techniques, JSON, or um, database queries, or Modbus, or many, many different types of methods of getting that data. Um, but essentially, the system has decided um, that in each of those points, it knows enough information to, to give you this, the, this data. So in this case, the train was at uh, 27 kilometers an hour. Um, well, yeah, um, it's at three kilometers and it had a length of just over 110 um, meters. 
so we, we did this for, for quite a few trains um, and we compared the, the, the train, uh, the data from the DAS to the data from an axle counter, which is kind of in the same kind of area. Um, in terms of speed, all of our speeds matched within 10% of the axle counter. Um, and in terms of train lengths, which is the, the, the challenging one, um, all except one of them, uh, which is that outlier and van, we underestimated the length, uh, lie within 10% of the axle counter. There's a lot of work ongoing to improve these algorithms, so we're, we're only going to get better and better and better at uh, uh, picking up the, the velocity and the length of the train. One of the other things uh, we've been working on quite recently is how, how do we give you information about um, uh, train timetables. Um, this is a, an example data set. Um, there's a station um, and we've set up some zones either side of the station where we're going to monitor more closely what's going on in those zones. Um, from the system, um, you can get the timings of trains going in and out of those, those zones. Um, and these two at 11.22 correspond with those two trains um, crossing that box at the top. Now you can see the immediate problem, um, and the one we're, we're, we're trying to address at the moment. How do you tell whether a train's stopped at the station or whether it's going straight through? Um, and at the moment, that's a, um, a, um, our software team are currently working on ways of, um, of doing that. So on this DAS timing, which is pretty straightforward to get out of the system, we can actually then highlight the ones where they've actually stopped at the station and at what times. So, Extracting that list is straightforward. Extracting all the information from what that means in terms of was that a freight train, did that train stop, um, uh, how long did it stop for, and all of that kind of stuff, that's a, um, something we're working on at the moment. So I've got a few more slides, and the, the next slides are a bit more, a bit more blue sky. Um, they're things which are, are currently in progress, um, and uh, we're working on using them um, to, to make the system a lot more, um, a lot more informative. So one of them is which track is your um, train on? You can see from this previous one, they're clearly not on the same track. Um, it, it's, and we see this often, you have train, and a few slides later, you'll see trains and they're crossing each other and the signals look the same, in terms of their energy anyway. But if you look more closely at the signal, you'll see the top plot there has got three trains uh, crossing the 500 meter section of track and the signal we get back from that track is very characteristic of that track. The bottom plot shows um, two trains but on different tracks and you see they've got a different characteristic signature um, and those we can use those characteristic signatures to tell which track the train is on. Um, and we can use the machine learning uh, module to do that. We have a near and a far track, um, or uh, a northbound, southbound track, and you can build a machine learning model so that they appear as a, a different colour on the, the plot. So instead of pink, you can have a blue one for the different tracks. Um, the other challenge we're trying to come across is uh, we're trying to get a better feeling for the data as trains are crossing each other. Um, there's, this is another way of doing it. We guess if we know which train track they're on, we can track them across each other. But the other way of doing it is using some um, edge analysis of the train, and you're basically predicting where the train is going so that you can track a train through the crossing point and then out the other side. So there's a lot of techniques, and we're, the way we've built the system, the software system, these are plugins to, to the system. So the system's very modular. Uh, we, can, we can add different detectors, we can add different um, uh, signal processing modules, we can add different machine learning modules. The entire thing is uh, set up so that if this gives us better results for trains, we can add that into the system um, and move forward. The other thing we're looking at uh, is uh, bogey counting. Um, it's, I'm not going to spend too, too long on these two slides uh, because I think Max has got some information on these as well. Uh, it is possible, um, it, the signals are there, um, in this case uh, we measured 16 bogies. Um, the thing about this particular test is that it was done at 62 kilometres away from the interrogator, um, so it was at a, a, quite, a, quite a distance, so the signal to noise ratio wasn't the best, uh, but we could still pick up at each of the bogies. Um, 
it would be fantastic to pick up each axle, um, but I think that's going to be challenging, but uh, maybe in a few years' time. So the next slide, uh, again, is just another iteration of the, the boat recounting. Um, it just highlights that uh, sometimes when um, the boat is very close together, like they are in uh, some of the um, uh, your um, metro systems, um, it's difficult to pick up. But we have ways around that, and uh, um, I think Max got a slide on that. Flat wheel detection, not a, it seems to be not a problem. Uh, we had a, a train um, which had a known uh, flat wheel, um, and we knew where it was. So we just looked at the, the signal characteristics, and actually, a flat wheel has got a really clear, higher frequency characteristic. Um, the plot's there, the top one is a low frequency output, and the bottom one is a higher frequency output. Um, both are available, just a click of a button um, on the interface. Um, and the bottom one had, shows a clear peak at bogey number eight. Um, so we can tell that uh, on the eighth bogey on that particular train, uh, there's a flat wheel. Uh, again, this we can extract the data and we can analyse it and we can tell you there's a flat wheel. Um, the real challenge is to put this into an automated system. And instead of those pink and blue dots, you want a pink blue, then you want a red, or a red with a cross, and, and identify all these features from that DAS data. Um, and I think we're getting there. Um, another one which we did um, was a, um, a lightning discharge. Now, we're kind of doing this kind of work for our power cable um, monitoring. So when you're looking at overhead power cables, it's very important to see where there's lightning strikes on those power cables. Um, but it kind of also applies to um, arcing or, or um, any kind of discharge in the ground network. In this particular case, um, the photo here, there is an arc formed from the top line to uh, the bottom line, and there is a cable in the bottom line, and there's a cable on the ground, the other side of this equipment. And the two plots on the right hand side, um, one shows the signal from the ground cable, and one shows the signal from the actual overhead cable. And they're huge signals. Yeah, it's, uh, they're way above the noise floor of the system. Um, it, they're not far off the size of a train. Uh, train roughly is 20 to 30 radians, um, and uh, here um, it's 5 radians. So that arc which we generated created a, a really big signal um, with a characteristic frequency as well. So just to summarise, um, it's a really exciting area and I'm really, really pleased um, that there's so many people interested in it. Um, for myself, it's very exciting um, that it, there's so much um, passion around using DAS for the rail network uh, monitoring. Um, it's incredible. There are diff several different types of DAS hardware out there and uh, um, choosing which DAS hardware you use is quite important. It's, DAS for rail is, is, is newish, but it has been around for quite a long time in other areas, um, particularly power cable monitoring the pipelines. Uh, we've got a great software toolbox um, which we can add things to and uh, we, can, we can build on that to give you the information you need to uh, 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 monitor your network. And the thing I really like is that trains generate a huge signal. It's not like you're trying to pick up you know, a sheep walking across your cable um, with buried. When a train goes past, the signal is huge and uh, it makes it really easy to deal with. So, um, so thank you and uh, any questions? Just a, good, a bit of confirmation, the, you produce the box and you utilise existing capacity on the client's fibre network. Yes. So apart from your box, which is in a little safe cabin, out on the infrastructure is buried fibre, no other power, no other sensors, nothing. Just a telecom fibre. And the telecom fibre to, to get it back. But well, just, just yeah. any, any, any fibre. Wow, well, it's pretty good. Right, well, let's get into some of the questions. Um, I know where this came up from because we, we saw this early on, but what is the minimum speed the train can be detected using DAS? So, it's, uh, 
it's not an easy question um, because it's the word detected. So as soon as a train starts to move, you will see something. Um, and we can see that as, they, as a train pulls out of a station, you can clearly see uh, the movement. And remember, I said how sensitive it was. If you could, the system could pick up me walking like this, it can certainly pick up a train moving. So detection is not the issue. It's how you turn that into um, a dot, saying I'm now moving at five kilometers an hour, 10 kilometers an hour. Uh, I've certainly seen um, detected events at five kilometers an hour um, for, for, from, from the data we've seen. Um, again, as we're learning and going forward, um, we'll get a better idea of how to handle those very low speeds um, because they do look different in terms of the data. Um, but uh, certainly, like I say, it's a very sensitive system and as soon as it starts to move, you see a signal, we just then need to use, put our signal processing around that data to say that it's a train moving. Um, we've been hearing about the fusion of sensors throughout this uh, set of lectures. Here we have one sensor and multiple applications and I think we're going to hear a term called the fusion of applications. And one of the questions here, um, and it's just moved, ah, here we go. But how does the machine learning, which is going to look at each of those algorithms, does it need any human intervention or does it get to a point where it can run itself on these multiple applications? Yes, yeah, so at the moment um, we teach it, teach it. So um, we, we have trains and uh, um, lots of them, and we can load those into a library, and we can say, um, for example, a good example is the near and far tracks from the cable. We can load those different trains into the machine learning library, uh, and teach it that that train's on the far track and this train's on the near track. Um, it's certainly something we're looking at to actually um, get the system to learn itself. Um, I, I did a presentation a, um, a few days ago at the, the fiber optic, um, the FOS um, pre-meet, um, which talked about um, how machine learning has got these different stages uh, where the supervised, unsupervised, deep learning, um, and how machine learning can, how machine learning techniques can be self-taught. Uh, and those kind of techniques are available. Um, it's just a case of, it kind of moves on to the civil four. It depends how much processing power you want to put on, on your unit. Um, a lot of it's driven by what we can do in terms of computing power. Um, but yeah. Uh, that question about SIL4, can I uh, ask that you ask this to the third speaker? He can start preparing his answer now. <laughs> and I'd like you to change that question because we are Greta Thunberg. I'd like to say, how can we get this technology to SIL4? Not, not what is limiting it. But please ask that question to the third speaker, and for a final one for you, and this is one everybody worries about. As a DAS is acoustic, yeah. if I've got a lot of noise mm -hmm. through a, a construction site to the right of my track, does it negate the DAS? Does it affect it? How do I deal with it? So actually, um, Max has got a good slide for this one as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it all up. Uh, the system, although you see red blobs and you see energies, the system sees um, the raw signal. It, it understands um, the, the time domain and the frequency domain components of those signals. And just like the human ear, ear uh, likes different music, the system can tell between different sounds. Um, and construction traffic um, and trains uh, have got very different sounds as far as the system is concerned. And it is possible for the, the, the machine learning to actually have two red blobs on the screen in terms of energy, but interpret them as totally different events, um, uh, very different events. So yes, it, it looks into the detail of those red blobs and it tells you what it is. Please show your appreciation for Gareth.